Well, that was new. <laughs> good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this uh, Lunch and Learn uh, this, this afternoon, Dangers in the Garden. I am Lily Browning, and I have some special guests today with me to talk about the dangerous things out there in the garden. I have Dr. Lester, who you see nodding in the corner there, uh, Dr. Bill Lester from County Extension, um, IFAS, University of Florida. He's going to be joining me. And a little bit later on, we have Karen from um, Hernando County Mosquito Control talking about those bloodsuckers there in the garden. Alrighty, and why don't we go ahead and just get started. I also want to welcome, I notice, some new guests today, and I want to welcome all of you. And um, I know who you are. <laughs> you're here because of Alice's email that you got yesterday, and um, you're, you generally attend our water awareness series. So thank you for um, coming and joining us. Uh, Rick Fody is kind of hiding out in the background as well, and he is recording this, so it'll be available on the Hernando County Broadcasting website as well. Let's talk about what kind of dangers in the garden we have. First of all, I always have to show you the Florida Friendly Nine Principles um, that have everything that I talk about one way or another is going to uh, wrap up or wrap around one or more of these nine principles. And Dr. Lester does too, because the University of Florida, you know, really promotes these. So when he teaches master gardeners, he teaches them Florida friendly landscaping, as well as a lot of in-depth and more advanced things, but it's still built around Florida friendly landscaping. Today, we're gonna to talk about the dangers that are out there since it's October, we thought we were going to have some fun. <laughs> so we'll have some uh, fun classes coming up. And this is kind of, we're going to try and present the serious topics in kind of a fun way. So since we're in Florida, the sun is probably one of the most major dangers out there. <laughs> um, not, um, I don't, I haven't covered here that it's dangerous uh, for your skin in the long term. Um, my husband is a fifth generation native Floridian, uh, but nobody told five generations ago, those Irish people that perhaps Florida might not be the place to settle. So even though he's native, he has a, a he has to really protect his skin. So keep that in mind as well. But as far as, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but it gets hot here. <laughs> Um, and I am, I react like a lot quicker than many other people. People might be surprised to know I love nature so much because I can't be out there in the heat of the day. It really does affect me um, quickly, but it can affect anyone. So just be careful when you're out there and, you know, take it seriously. Take our heat seriously and be on the lookout, you know, if you're not feeling well, don't push through. My principle, Lily's principle number one, is take care of the gardener. So if it's too hot out there, just, you know, don't, don't push through it. Look for early signs of heat illness, could be dizziness and fatigue, irritability, difficulty concentrating, we want you to drink a lot of water when you're out there and make sure you have loose, light colored clothing on and take breaks. I mean, there's not a race. If you have a pool, jump in the pool or go inside, cool down. Um, these are the signs of more serious illness and I'm sure you're all aware of them, but just keep that in mind. And by the way, um, let me go back to point out my email address at the bottom here. This is where you can email me, lilyb at hernandocounty.us, and say, hey, I'd like a PDF copy of Dangers in the Garden, and I'll be glad to send that to you with all of this information. Um, do it through my email, because I will see my email when we're done with this. I may not see the chat again. 
uh, ways to beat the heat is to work in the cooler parts of the day. Here is where you're going to hear some conflicting information. I'm going to tell you that now because Karen is going to tell you not to be out there <laughs> at dawn or dusk because that's when the mosquitoes are out there. But that is also the cooler parts of the day. So I would say, you know, dress for mosquito protection. Um, wear that sunscreen. It's very important for your long-term health. And again, the cool light colored clothing, rest often. And I want you to drink water. And then I want you to drink more water. I'm in water conservation. I'm all for saving water, but I want you to take all that water that you save and put it in yourself and um, make sure that, you know, you're hydrated and staying well. If there's any signs, if you, your partner, anyone that you're around showing any signs of heat stroke, Call 911 right away because it is very serious. I will let Dr. Lester hop on now and talk to us a little bit about equipment and safety. And, you know, we live in Hernando County, so it's very possible that all of these pictures may have been taken here. Don't you agree, Bill? Yeah, and we don't recommend people doing any of these different things that you see pictured here. And I know if you look online or if you're on Facebook, there's millions of pictures of people doing right, crazy bye -bye. things with, with bye -bye. trucks. And I have pictures of people on standing on a forklift to uh, trim a palm tree frond. We don't recommend any of that. Um, equipment in your garden and around your house is very important. And the reason why we get it and we use it is to make our lives easier and better. It's, I know, from personal experience, it's a lot of work to be out there with just a handsaw, trimming palm trees and trimming other, you know, trees. So things like chainsaws, gas-powered lawnmowers, uh, pole trimmers for uh, tall palm trees to be able to get to those fronds are supposed to make our lives easier, but they can all be very, very dangerous. And like some of the pictures here, even just a small 21-inch regular $100, at least they used to cost, start at $100 uh, lawnmower, can be very dangerous because it has a sharp blade that's spinning around. I know that I've seen my neighbors in the past out there with nothing but a pair of shorts on and either bare feet or flip-flops cutting the grass. You don't want to do that. I did not look up the numbers on how many people end up going to the emergency room with all kinds of different uh, lawn and yard associated in injuries per year, but it has to be quite a few. So you always want to wear um, sturdy shoes. Don't be out there on your bare feet. Don't be out there on flip flops. Even tennis shoes don't give you a whole lot of support. Go and invest in a good pair of work boots. Steel toe work boots are great. They give you um, a much better ankle support and you're going to avoid being um, having your feet injured. Mostly be aware and be conscious of what you're doing. Things like gas power chainsaws are potentially very, very dangerous. You really have to concentrate while you're using them. Don't do anything really wacky or not recommended. Like um, if you live in a yard where you have a hill, like trying to you know use a rope to lower the lawnmower and pull it back up. <laughs> Most of it is just being aware and following the manufacturer's safety recommendations. So when it comes to um, using equipment to trim, uh, whether it be a palm tree or an oak tree or bushes or hedges or something, be very, very cognizant of power lines and stay well away from power lines. You don't want to be trimming anything near a power line. So either contact your local utility company and find out if maybe it's their responsibility to prune it or hire a um, licensed and insured uh, tree service to take those tree branches out. You need to stay uh, a good working distance away from other people when using pruning tools or equipment. I've seen horror stories about children being injured, riding in daddy's lap on a lawnmower and falling off. So we don't ever want to hear about something like that happening. <clears throat> you have to be very aware because when you get out there and start trimming bushes, and trees, you may encounter bees, wasps, snakes, other animals. So, you know, keep your eyes open and be very alert to those things. 
The last thing you want to do is find yourself up on top of a ladder and discover a bee's nest. So you want to try to figure out if there's bees or wasps up there before you climb up on the ladder. Don't start trying to um, cut things that are larger than the equipment you have is rated for. Mm -hmm. So when we're pruning something, if it's very, very small, you use hand clippers, if it's a little bit bigger, you have loppers, you have a pruning saw, anything above, you know, that gets really large, you're gonna be using some kind of chainsaw. You use, you need to use the right piece of equipment and the right tool for that job. Um, before making a cut, always know where your hands and fingers are. Pay attention. Uh, don't be throwing things off of your ladder. You know, if you're not, you know, take a chainsaw and just drop it down to somebody or hand it up to somebody, especially while it's running. Uh, you really, re I've used chainsaws before and I've owned chainsaws and you really have to be careful with them because you don't ever want to have any kind of injury from a chainsaw. It's usually very, very bad. And then, um, if you're working with other people, make sure that you're aware of what they're doing and they're aware of what you're doing. I had a neighbor across the street who had a number of trees taken down out of his front yard and a service came by and there was about 10 of them. And it was amazing. I stood there and watched them for a while. They worked very well together. They all used safety equipment. They all knew what each other was doing. So when one cut a branch that was coming down, Others knew that it was coming down and they would get out of the way. So it's almost like um, uh, well orchestrated. They all work together very, very well as a team because they do it all day long. If you're working with you know, friends or relatives or children to do it and you don't do it for a job, you need to warn everybody because you're not gonna be used to working as a team like they are. And then take frequent breaks so, I mean, don't climb up there on a ladder and wear yourself out and start getting tired and get to the point where your arms are failing because that's when you lose attention and start dropping things and maybe overestimate, you know, well, if I cut this branch, I can hold it up with my one hand. Don't overestimate. You need to know what you're doing. So next slide. So you really have to remember if you're using any kind of electric equipment because my hedge clippers are electric hedge clippers and they have an extension cord but you can't use them in the pouring rain because it's electric so along with damaging the equipment it could potentially be dangerous you don't want to be using anything that involves an extension cord or electric outdoors when either it's raining or misting or very, very early in the morning when it's still very, very wet, you wanna make sure that it's good and dry. And you wanna follow good um, basic safety uh, advice when it comes to using ladders. So you need to have a ladder on a solid piece of ground. You don't wanna, um, because I know from using ladders outside, you wanna put it on the ground and make sure it's safe and secure ladders one foot or the other can sink into the sand very easily. Uh, you want to be very careful when moving ladders around. So you really want to follow all the manufacturer's directions. You don't want to fall off of a ladder. And if you're not using ladders all the time, it's a very easy thing that's going to happen to you. So next slide. Uh, you can talk about this one, Bill. Okay. I can't well, look at this slide. <laughs> I'm not really a medical doctor, no. but if you remember from when you were a kid having to get your tetanus shot and if you got injured on the playground and got all kinds of dirt and, you know, your road rash and everything, they'd always ask when your last tetanus shot was. So even as an adult, you need to keep that in mind. When you're working outdoors, and I don't think that we really have specific slides on it, keep in mind there's a lot of huge all the bacteria in the world lives outdoors and it is in hiding in places that you may not think of about one little piece of advice for anybody who's dealing with a palm tree a lot of our palms have very sharp spikes or thorns on them and you want to be very very careful when you're pruning those branches because you don't want a palm tree branch to fall and poke you with that spike either in your head or in your arm or in your body, because a lot of times there's really nasty bacteria on those thorns. 
And I've known people who got really, really nasty infections from just being poked by a palm tree branch and you, you think nothing of it. You know, oh, well, you know, I'll put a Band-Aid on it, I'll be fine. You wake up the next day and you have, you know, a very, very serious infection. So be very careful when getting poked by things, even, you know, dealing with soil and digging around through the soil. You want to be very careful that um, you wash up very, very well afterwards because there are so many different dangerous bacteria out there. And there are plenty of things that you can trip and fall over also, things like tree roots and uh, sprinkler heads. And here you have a picture of the sprinkler um, uh, boxes where you have the um, controllers and wiring in it also. So be very, very aware and careful of things that are in your yard. Um, you want to be very careful with stumps also, maybe get those stumps ground out. You mm -hmm. don't want your yard to turn into a dangerous place, whether you're working out there or you have children or grandchildren or a meter reader or somebody else going through your yard. So always keep your eyes open and try to keep it as safe as possible. I Next slide. I'm trying. <laughs> okay, no problem. No rush. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Okay, trees. We have had other presentations about trees and what you want to look for in a tree to help determine whether it's safe or not safe. We always recommend dealing with and hiring a certified arborist to come and look at that tree and give you his uh, professional opinion on it. We can tell you a certain amount about what's going on with your trees from pictures but you probably are going to need an arborist to come and actually look at it and stand there and look up and determine exactly what is going on with your tree. Trees do need to, if you have very large trees on your property, they don't magically take care of themselves for, you know, 20, 30, 50 years at a time. You're going to have to have a professional look at them. They take a certain amount of maintenance. If they have dead branches or a dead um, codominant stem, which uh, in this picture on the left here, you kind of sort of see trees will develop multiple trunks. And if one of them, you know, starts to get too heavy or dead or dangerous, the tree may actually split, which is how a lot of times the uh, picture on the right here, that's what happened. So you probably want to contact a certified arborist to, and have them come out and look at it once a year, every other year and get them trimmed up to remove any dead material. That's a really good way to get an early warning that you have a tree problem because you don't wanna learn about your tree problem halfway through a tropical storm. When you hear that really, really loud noise outside in the middle of the night and you hear something hitting the roof and rain starts to come in through you know, a hole in the roof, you don't wanna go that route. You always want to try to figure out if you have a problem well in advance and get it taken care of. It's much cheaper and much safer to do that. If you need uh, advice and information on who is a certified arborist within Hernando County, if you contact our office, we do have a list of people that are all licensed and certified with um, the International Society of Arboriculture, and we can recommend some names and phone numbers to you much 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 better plan than way you know when bob comes to your door and offers to take down some trees <laughs> yes so there is a difference between tree services and arborist an arborist can look at a tree and tell you whether it's safe or not whether it's healthy or not give you advice on whether it should be cut down or kept or what can be done a tree service will cut down a tree right. that's it now, a lot of sometimes they may not even be able to tell you what kind of tree it is. If you want that tree cut down, they can cut it down. And that's all they do. They don't give you advice on it. They can't tell you if it's healthy or not. If it's an obvious dead tree, they may be um, worth a worthwhile company to look at. But of course, you always want to make sure that they are insured because if they are climbing a tree and potentially injuring themselves on your property, and they don't have workman's comp or insurance, if they get hurt, you're the one that has to pay the bill. So enough said with that. Make sure they have insurance. Okay, now I will. 
start talking a little bit about some of these poisonous plants here. And, you know, we do have them in Florida. Probably the most common one that we have on this list here is going to be the poison ivy. Um, we do have some poison oak and poison sumac and poison wood, but they're just not as uh, prevalent or well known as the poison ivy. And you see the poison ivy has three leaves there. Um, it's pretty easy to recognize once you get to know it. Now, the thing is, you know, I know I have some family members who are very allergic and have all kinds of problems with it. So far in my lifetime, you know, I could probably roll around in it and not have an issue. <laughs> but I know that your body changes. It can just change over time and suddenly you find yourself allergic. So, of course, I don't do that. So just respect it. Um, and these are what the various poison plants look like. On the bottom there, very popular or very common, I should say, uh, vine here called Virginia creeper. Parts of it are turning red right now. It's bringing some nice fall color for you. Virginia creeper is not poisonous. It gets accused of being poison ivy, but if you look at these two leaves, you can definitely tell the difference. Um, now, I'm not saying that your Virginia creeper, creeper might not have one of these poisonous vines growing up with it. So you always just want to be careful, but um, I never did convince my mother that uh, Virginia creeper was not going to, <laughs> um, you know, give her a big rash and problems. And it could be at one time she ran into both. So she just accused both of them of, of the problem. Here's another, stinging nettle is kind of one of those catch names for several different plants that hurt. Um, <laughs> The, the top one and also the the bottom right one, very common in where I live in the Royal Highlands. I found it uh, the first week we lived here, 12 years ago when we moved here and I was pulling some weeds. I found it on my hand and it hurt. And <laughs> feels like, you know, a bunch of wasp stings or something and it just, it won't go away for a while. Um, they also call this tread softly touch me not, um, pretty little yellow, I mean, I'm sorry, white flowers on them. And you know, they're pollinators, but they're not something you want to rub against. So either try and get them out with some heavy gloves or just steer clear of them, which is what I do. But if I had grandkids around more often who were trying to run around through it, I would definitely try to get those out of there. Now these are just a few of the plants that are poisonous upon ingestion. I mean, they're not going to hurt you just existing. Um, if you eat them, yeah, you, you could have some pretty severe problems. The lantana on the top, it's an invasive exotic anyway. So good thing to get rid of, but it, because of its invasive tendencies, it tends to take over um, cattle fields and stuff, and this will kill cows. It's, you know, they, they think it's really good. It's like candy to them. So they eat so much of it, they can die from it. Um, so if you have, you know, a puppy or a cat who likes to chew on things, this would be a very big concern that you don't want to have in your yard. You could add different sagos to that list too, and even our native kunchi that you don't want if you have some dogs who like to chew things. Um, the coral beans there, I think they make, I know they can make uh, a poison out of it. Bill, you, you might know which poison it is. I'm thinking ricin, but that might not be what it is that they make from the coral beans. No, rice, yeah, ricin's from a different plant. I can oh, okay. picture, I can't remember the name. Yes, regardless. The, the seeds on coral bean are poisonous. Yes, yes, they are. Um, and an oleander, it, it's made its way, made, it has made its way into our, you know, pop culture in that there's some books written of how someone managed to poison someone by having them ingest the, uh, I think it's called white oleander, you know. Um, every single part of the oleander is poison if you eat it. And some people have uh, 
issues too if it's just burned. Now, you know, you can avoid that problem with any of these or any other uh, plants that are out there by just not eating them, you know, then you won't have a terrible problem with them. Mushrooms, I'm not a mycologist, so I don't know, you know, I get my white mushrooms that pop up in my yard. I am not taking the chance of trying to decide which ones are edible, which ones are not. If Publix doesn't have them wrapped up in cellophane with a price tag on them, I'm just going to avoid eating them. Um, just, you know, maybe other people have more knowledge than I do, but I'm not willing to take the chance with, with mushrooms. Now, as I said, you just avoid eating them, but maybe you have pets that didn't. <laughs> and if you are concerned, Here's the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Hotline. There's the phone number right there. And there's another 800 number for poison help. Also, if you go to their website, they have lists of plants poisonous to pets um, to keep in mind as well. I know that the sago palms, if they get a hold of the, the seeds, you know, the cones, from the sago palms, I have known people who have lost dogs who have gotten a hold of those. So, and as I said, our native kunti can be the same way. I got some, I love kunti, and I started to plant it in the backyard where my little dogs run, and it dawned on me, oh no, I probably should not do that. Let me go put them where they aren't going to be. Okay, back to our resident entomologist to talk to us about the best part of danger in the garden, uh, the insects. Yes, a lot of people probably assumed from the title of this presentation is gonna be mostly about insects because people see, some people seem to think that every insect outdoors, along with every snake and everything else that's living out there, is set on chasing you around and biting you or stinging you or hurting you. And with insects, we do have a number of biting, stinging insects that live outdoors. Obviously, we have things like bees and wasps, which you can find by accident. I know that I've found wasps many, many times in my life, hiding underneath a leaf or branch, something like that, when you're working in the hedges or especially trimming a palm tree, they'll make their nest right up underneath the palm frond and you kind of find them the hard way. We do have biting ants, but not every ant out there is a fire ant. We have probably over a hundred species of ants in Florida and many of them do not bite. They do not sting. So talking about fire ants here, not every ant out there is going to bite you, but we do have fire ants. They do live here. We have a couple different species. Um, and like I said, bees and a couple other unusual insects, normally they're only gonna bother you if you bother them and kind of pick them up and start playing with them. Yep. So here, you, you can go back to the, right there. So um, with fire ants, if you do have an issue with fire ants in your yard, you're probably gonna to have to use some kind of chemical control. Uh, the best thing to use is some kind of bait type of pesticide. Very important that you follow the directions and use it at the right time of year and apply it correctly. That way you're gonna have the best chance of success in having it work and control the ants. Unfortunately, sometimes these things, you'll kill one anthill and they'll just pop up 20 feet away and you tend to, it seems like you're chasing them around your yard. And that's because you are chasing them around your yard. So my, something my you get to pull up. My neighbor and I, we play fire ant chess. Between yeah, our two yeah. yards. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of times they are going to take um, some diligence on your part. It's not as simple as apply uh, pesticide once and then all your problems are solved. You're going to have to keep an eye on them and treat early, probably treat more than once. Um, most of the different devices that work with getting rid of pests in general, 
I have not found to work and they do make sound activated devices for everything to get rid of moles and gophers in your yard, getting rid of mice and roaches inside of your house. I've seen those. I think researchers, they, you know, researchers have experimented with them and tried them and found they really don't work. So you want to be careful before you put money into purchasing something that it's going to actually work. If you have what you think is a, a problem insect in your yard and you don't know what it is, contact our office. We can identify it for you. And then we can find out what the best control is going to be. So you don't spend money on 10 different things that don't work before you spend money on a thing that does work. What okay. do you feel about um, like a citrus type drench for fire ants? I've heard that UF has had some success with that. That tends to, that's going to be more of a deterrent. So they don't like that and it will make them leave. It doesn't specifically kill them or doesn't kill them in large numbers. Okay. Something that does work with a fire ant mound or hill, if you're able to dump boiling water on it, that can work. That can kill a lot of the ants and hopefully it's going to kill the queen and then the survivors are going to move on. So that is a potential viable control. Yeah, be very careful though, because boiling water is also a danger. Exactly, don't, don't hurt yourself with <laughs> boiling water. I actually just did that this morning, but it dawned on me as I was doing it because as soon as the spigot was turned off and our rain stopped, the fire ants appeared. Um, and I have them all along like the front sidewalk, but it dawned on me I only did part of it because they are also under this salvia that I have and I couldn't pour the boiling water on the salvia without killing my my salvia as well. So I'm exactly to to boiling do. water will kill plants too so you have yeah. to use it in a spot where you're not going to damage any uh, worthwhile plants. Right. So we do have a lot of different stinging insects here in Florida. But a lot of them, the old saying that if you just leave them alone, they'll leave you alone, really does hold true. So even though that we have literally hundreds of species of native bees here in Florida, most of them, things like bumblebees, mud daubers, and even cicada killers and a lot of others, do not look to sting you. you I tell people you literally have to catch it and start poking at it. If you do that, they can and they will sting but they're not looking to sting you. Some other ones are very aggressive. And if you get too close to their, their nest or their hive or home, they will come after you and they will, they are very happy to sting you. Yellow jackets can be very, very dangerous, especially if you accidentally find one of their nests, they tend to make nests in a hole in the ground. Paper wasps, um, sure, most of us are familiar with them. You'll find them hiding in your bushes, underneath a palm tree frond. And if you get too close, they will come out and sting you. Um, honeybees, honeybees generally are not that dangerous. They can sting you, but if you generally leave them alone, they're gonna leave you alone. And scorpions, we do have scorpions here in Florida, a couple different species, but they tend to be small. And as a general rule, then they will sting you. And it will hurt. I haven't been stung by one, but I've heard that it hurts really bad. But we do not have the really dangerous species like they have in the desert southwest. So people rarely die from a scorpion bite. Yeah. You may have to see a doctor or visit the emergency room. And if you're allergic to it, that may not be the case. But most people, most of our scorpions are not fatal biters like other species if you go to the deserts of the southwest. Maybe, but if you live out in the country, out in the woods, you may have quite a few scorpions out there. Oh, Royal Highlands, we have plenty. <laughs> yeah, you have them out there. And I've had people bring me samples in alcohol that they just collected either in the, and you can find them in your house. Oh yeah, yes, yep, they're in my house. You gotta watch your shoes. <laughs> yeah, and they like to hide in kitchen cabinets and other cabinets, they like it all the way in the back where it's dark. So keep your eyes open when you're digging to the back for that pot or pan that you don't use very often. And when, now, you, discuss kill, yeah, when you discuss killer bees, um, what's not on this slide, because it's such a new phenomenon, make sure you talk about murder hornets too. 
Okay, well, starting with killer bees, I know they're the topic of a lot of not very well-made movies in the <laughs> past. And what they are is they are Africanized honeybees. So they are a subspecies of honeybee that was brought to Brazil many years ago because they thought if it bred with uh, European honeybees in Brazil, they would end up with a much better strain of honeybee that's going to tolerate heat and humidity and make a lot more honey. And it didn't work out really well. So they did breed with the uh, European honeybees that were in Brazil. And then bit by bit, they have spread to the US. They are here in Florida, but they are so, there's no pure Africanized honeybees. They're all, the genetics are all watered down at this point. And what an Africanized honeybee is, is a honeybee that tends to be a little bit more aggressive if you go near the nest or start messing with the um, beehive. So uh, beekeepers have problems with Africanized honeybees, but as a general rule, because I, I know and I work with beekeepers, they'll have a number of beehives and they'll tell you this hive, uh, there are very, very friendly bees, this hive, they're not quite as friendly this hive or this group of bees is hot. And that means that they're just a little bit more aggressive. They do not try to hunt you down in the middle of the night and sting you or kill you, but you still have to be very, very careful, especially going through all these things on this list because mm -hmm. honeybees in general can swarm and set up a new nest in a tree, in an abandoned vehicle, in a shed, in a garage, uh, an outbuilding that you haven't been into for a long time. They'll get up into chimneys. They'll get into people's attics, uh, crawl spaces up underneath a trailer or a building or a shed. So you always need to keep your eyes open and you don't want to find a bee's nest the hard way by surprise. That's... And generally if the hive is outgrowing its structure and they keep building on it anyway, that's one of the indicators that there's some Africanized honeybees in there as well. It can, but African, we do not have any pure African honeybees yeah. here and they don't sting any harder and they are no more poisonous than a European honeybee. They're just more aggressive. It's just they're, they're more aggressive. When you get close to them, they're going to get a little more excited and come after you quicker than a friendly bee would from a friendlier hive. Teresa's bees are all very friendly, right? Yeah, and, and she'll tell you, um, you know, she'll, she'll go and get a, a, a hive and get them into a box and she'll say either they're hot or they're friendly. Mm -hmm. So it's not black and white or A and B. There's, an, uh, there's just a huge range of gray in between because the genetics have gotten so mixed yeah. that we yeah. do not have any pure races or strains of honeybees in the United States anymore. It's all one big mixture. Well, and honeybees are not native to the United States to begin with. No, they're native to all different parts of Europe. It might be they've come from Italy, they've come from Central Europe, they've come from Russia, and even those are each different type is slightly different from the other types. So what can you tell us about these murder hornets that we're hearing about? Murder hornets, you probably heard about in the news a while back. It is an Asian species of hornet that is very large. They're very, very big hornets and they sting very hard and they can potentially be dangerous. They are not here in Florida. They have found them in just a few instances in Washington state, possibly Oregon, but I think it's mostly Washington state and up into Canada. And part of that is just because we have so much trade with Asia, we're moving so many ships filled with pallets and containers and stuff between continents that these things will sometimes pop up and they are located and then quickly gotten rid of. So they do have a very good detection um, network out there in the Western United States. They're always on the lookout for them. And here in Florida, Florida Department of Agriculture has a very good team of people that are always on the outlook for new, for murder hornets, for new species of snails, for new lizards, for new everything that just comes to Florida, literally on a weekly basis. 
So don't worry about murder hornets. They are not here. If you see a hornet and it seems pretty large, it's probably just a native species of hornet because they can get pretty large sometimes. But stinging caterpillars can be very, very dangerous and extremely painful. I've never had a, a run-in with one where I've actually gotten poked by them. But these are all caterpillars that they tend to be very furry or hairy. And some of the hairs on them are called urticating. U-R-T-I-C-A-T-I-N-G. So that's your vocabulary word for the day. And urticating means poisonous. So some of the hairs on them have a poison gland. So if you bump into them, pick them up, brush into them with your arm, and those hairs touch your arm, they'll poke you and inject you with their poison. So the pictures on here the saddleback caterpillars are pretty common and they'll hurt. Buck moth caterpillar, I've never seen. Had caterpillar, I have seen, but they're not very common. The puss caterpillar, and it doesn't even look like a caterpillar. I've heard it looks, well, I've seen them before they, and they feed on oak trees. We have a lot of oak trees here. So for a month or two in the summer, they can be very common. It looks like um, a cat's hairball. Basically, it looks like a little ball of fur. They can be very dangerous, and a lot of people get injured by them. And a lot of people go to the emergency room, and there's not a whole lot they could do for you other than it stops hurting after about a day or so. So you don't want to find out the hard way just how much it hurts. Lanham moth caterpillar is another very painful one. Spiny oak slug caterpillar is painful, but I've... I, never seen one in real life so they're not very common but watch out for the puss caterpillar because for about two months if you have oak trees you there's a very good chance that you will see them and they will definitely hurt you with those those little fluffy hairs on them so spiders if i have spiders also mm -hmm. i am not an expert on spider id we have a huge number of species of spiders here in florida all of them can bite because all of them chew up and feed on something else for food. All of them are technically venomous, but they're not all poisonous. So all of them have some kind of venom that when they catch an insect or their prey, whatever they, you know, their species eats, they catch it and they bite it and it's going to um, either paralyze or kill their prey. Most spiders, even though they could, could all bite you, most of them are not particularly poisonous to people, but there are some species that are. Obviously, we're all familiar with black widows. Here in Florida, we have brown widows, red widows. Uh, they all make egg sacs prolifically. So you always wanna keep your eyes open, especially like in a shed where you haven't been into it for a long time, underneath your grill in your backyard, spiders love that spot. And so, so just look Under before your you chair. put your hand somewhere to make sure you're not putting it in a spider web or grabbing a hold of a spider. Under your porch chairs or lawn chairs as well. Sure, underneath or behind, they like really good hiding spots. Now spiders as a general rule are very beneficial in your garden. As a general rule, what they do is they eat insects all day long and make babies, that's kind of, and make webs, that's all they do. So they're beneficial, so don't go out there just randomly killing all the spiders, but be aware of them and be careful and don't play with the spiders unless you know for sure what it is. So recluses, brown recluses, and there's always been a big debate about this, about whether they're in Florida or not. And you and I are going to debate right now. Technically, from the scientists, they are not here. I do know of somebody who is doing research on it to find out for sure whether they are here or not. Yeah. Everybody seems to think that everybody, I see on so many different insect and spider identification websites and Facebook groups, they're always posting pictures of the brown recluse that I found in my shoe or in my garage or in my backyard. Everybody thinks they're here. So whether they're here or not, just be careful outside. 
And Chilean recluse, these are just more scary spiders that if they bite you, they will hurt you and they will probably injure you also because they can be very poisonous. I I had a family member who was bitten and, you know, continued to have problems with that area, you know, the rest of his life, really. And um, so whether or not they're established here, you know, they are something you need to watch out for. Yeah, you a lot of, with a lot of things. It's safer if you just assume that it it may or could be present here in Florida, because it seems like if it isn't present here today, it will be really soon. So yeah, that's pretty much true. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lester, and I'm going to okay. talk a little bit about snakes now. And I'm not a herpetologist or a snake expert, but you know, we'll just kind of lightly cover it. And I apologize now if you're like Indiana Jones here and don't like snakes. I tortured myself at the beginning with that needle. So just do what I did. If you don't like to look at these pictures of the snakes, do what I did and and look away um, when we talk about snakes. But snakes are also a very important part of Florida's ecosystem. And I certainly uh, would rather have the black racer that's in my backyard than any kind of rodents. Um, You know, they do play an important part. Of all the 50 species of snakes in Florida, only six of them are considered poisonous. And one of them, um, the copperhead, unless you're listening from the panhandle, you are very unlikely to run across that guy down here. So I know you may have run into him in New York or Pennsylvania or Kentucky or wherever. Um, They just kind of inhabit the very top of Florida. Copperheads are not really a thing in the rest of Florida. So that's what I just said. Really, they're just up there in the panhandle. Um, But even if you do get bit by one, um, usually not life-threatening. But of course, if I got bit by a snake, I'm going to the hospital. I don't care, you know, what happens. So I would certainly recommend that uh, of you as well. Now the cotton mouth or the water moccasin, you know, all the longtime Floridians will tell you that these, every other snake will do its best to avoid you. And the water moccasin has a um, reputation as very, being very aggressive on their own. Like they'll pursue you. I mean, they're not going to knock on your door and try to get in your house, but you know, if you're out where they are, usually in the water, I've heard of them, what they say, jumping in boats. Um, I think they may just fall out of the trees. They're startled or something. Your brown banded water snake will do the same thing. And of course, if one falls in your boat, you don't care what it is, you're going to be, (laughs) you know, freaking out, but just um basically stay out of their way and you know if they do get in your boat then do your best to use some kind of long piece of equipment to get them back out but if you do get bitten then of course seek medical care as soon as humanly possible This is probably the one I hear the most about. People have interactions with the Eastern Diamondback rattlesnakes. I hear about several people a year having, you know, some kind of interaction, but also really the only people you ever, I ever hear about who get bitten are the ones who are messing with the snake (laughs) in some form or another, you know. if you just go your way and they go theirs, you're probably going to be okay. Now, if you're concerned because it may be in your yard and you have pets and all that, that's another issue. And, you know, I would then hire someone to come and get it removed. And of course, you know, they are quite poisonous. So the best thing to do is to stay out of their way and don't rely on the rattle. They may not always <laughs> Uh, rattle for you. They, uh, you know, sometimes they do, but in general, most snakes, it takes a lot of energy to bite someone, and their venom is like precious to them. It's like money. They use it 
to acquire food like we do you know we spend money to get food they spend venom to get food and they spend a lot of energy doing that so they don't want to spend it on you because they can't swallow you <laughs> therefore if they do it it's because they feel threatened so the best thing you can do is do what you can to get out of their way so they don't feel as threatened and the timber rattler kind of along the same family um, again it can be easily overlooked because look at their colors that can easily blend in with some leaves so if you're out in the woods just be very careful i try to um stomp around <laughs> i make you know i stomp a little harder than i normally would have on those boots that bill recommended for mowing and i stomp around so that they know to get away from me because that's what they want to do pygmy rattlesnake again and he's he's small um and it does have a reputation for protecting himself now his bite is usually not life-threatening i love how this is written but can result in the loss of a digit <laughs> So I don't want to lose any digits <laughs> and they're about mouse sized, I guess. So that could be, you know, what they're mistaking them for. Rare cases have been fatal. As I said, if I get bit, um, I'm, I'm going to the hospital <laughs> as soon as I can. Coral snakes. I mean, we hear a lot about coral snakes and um, coral snakes are small. So young boys tend to like to pick them up and put them in their pockets. And that's when we hear about somebody getting bit. They um, are very interesting in that like most snakes can unhinge their jaws. Coral snake can't, they chew just like you and I. So therefore the only part of you that they can ever possibly um, bite is in between your fingers, which is why you know here of the little boys or the bigger boys who won't stop messing with them getting a bit or possibly uh, between your toes if you run into them. Um, and again, go to the hospital if you run into trouble. Here's the saying, I can never keep it straight. I don't know of anyone who can, but <laughs> if red touches yellow, it can kill a fellow. So we are looking here at an Eastern coral snake because the yellow and the red bands are touching each other. If red touches black, it's a friend of Jack. I'm not sure who Jack is, but there's a <laughs> scarlet king snake or a scarlet snake. So the point of this is we don't want to kill the guys who aren't any danger to us. And really a coral snake isn't, unless we happen to be running barefoot through the leaves or, you know, that we are handling it, maybe for pulling weeds or something, you know, just make sure you wear gloves. Other critters are out there as well. Um, and I just saw, this is very timely, um, I have a Facebook friend who lives now in Marion County and she took a picture around midnight outside her window of a bear out there in her, in her yard. And of course, Marion County is where the Ocala National Forest is. And they have a, about a bear population of about 300 up there. We hear uh, in, in the Chazowitzka, uh, you know, wildlife management area, we have a population of about 30 bears. That's why on 19, you'll see those bear crossing signs because years ago, I can't remember what year it was, it was in the 90s like four or five bears got ran over in that same <clears throat> nine month period, <clears throat> which is not good for, you know, such a small population of bears. So what happens is in the forest in Ocala, if there's a young male who was not able to, um, you know, win the battle between the older males <laughs> to find himself a girlfriend, he'll kind of get kicked out because he's seen as, you know, you're not any good here and he has to move on. Somehow or another, he knows I'm going to go over to the Chaz and I'm going to find me a woman over there. <laughs> they somehow know that, but the 
And that is actually quite good because then, you know, the more come over here, the less inbreeding stuff you have. It's better for diversity. But that journey between the Ocala National Forest over to the Chaz is very treacherous for the bear. Um, could run into other male bears, that's been a problem, and they have found young males killed by older males in that journey. But most likely, obviously, he's going to run into human populations. And, you know, he's going to be hungry. So, unfortunately, that ends his journey, and he never gets to the Chaz if he becomes a nuisance-type bear. So if there's some going, you know, if he's just passing through, Get out of his way and let him pass through. Don't leave dog food outside. Don't leave trash easily accessible. You know, don't do things that would attract him there for an easy meal. That's basically the, some of you may not even have known we had bears here in Florida, but we do. And here's Dr. Lester to tell us about coyotes. Okay. I'm not really a wildlife expert, but I am familiar with coyotes because we do have quite a few of them here in Hernando County. Um, I live in Spring Hill and I have seen a number of coyotes right in my neighborhood. It kind of, it varies a little bit neighborhood by neighborhood. Coyotes, let me see. They are invasive to a certain extent. People did bring them here, uh, you know, a hundred years ago in small numbers for hunting reasons, but coyotes have moved here from other states because they just do really well in urban situations. So some animals that just do well living around people, raccoons are another example. Raccoons do just great eating out of your trash can and finding plenty of food and living with people and even traffic and vehicles. Coyotes do the same thing. Coyotes, um, like golf courses and small wooded areas and they don't need a huge forest area like a bear does to be successful and happy they'll live right in your neighborhood and like i said i've seen plenty of them in spring hill there's not a whole lot you could do about coyotes uh very important that if you have small animals and pets you keep them safe if you have a cat that you care about don't let the cat run wild because cats will be eaten by coyotes I've read that um, coyotes will eat everything from lover grasshoppers to trash to uh, bottle caps all the way up through, you know, cats and dogs. They're not really picky about what they eat. They, they have a very open mind with what they eat. So that's probably one of the reasons why they're so successful. Um, very bird important. Seed one like, I just learned. Bird seed. I learned that one yesterday. So yeah, so you have to be aware that they could be eating your bird seed. Uh, if you have animals getting in your trash, they could be eating that. Please do not feed the stray cats in your neighborhood because coyotes will eat that and you'll, you'll end up attracting coyotes along with a lot of other animals. If you have cats that you care about, make them an indoor cat, you know, for the cat's sake and for everybody else's sake. But really, no matter what we do, we're we're going to have coyotes. We just kind of have to learn to live with it. There, I don't, I don't think there are any um, reported instances of coyotes killing or even seriously injuring somebody in Florida. They do make a lot of cats disappear. If you have a very small dog, that could be an issue. But other than that, uh, stay away from them, steer clear of them. They tend to be generally afraid of people but you wouldn't want to run across a coyote that's either sick or injured or uh, maybe has um, some kind of disease or something like that. And now it's going to turn around and attack you. So if you stay away from them, hopefully they'll stay away from you. But like I said, really not a whole lot we could do about it. If you do have a problem one, you could try calling animal control. But other than that, there's not a whole lot you could do about them. Make a lot of noise teach your kids to you know if they're around um if the coyotes are around teach your kids to yell scream bang things together things like that to scare them off yeah and they tend to be the most active at dawn and dusk mm -hmm. but that varies i've seen them at one o'clock in the afternoon crossing county line road 
So there are exceptions to that rule. Yes, and I have heard these are anecdotal stories from you know Facebook groups saying that they watched a coyote um, act like with their bigger dog, act like they were trying to attract the bigger dog to come play. One coyote was playing with their dog, but trying to attract him like into the woods where other coyotes were. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, you just, uh, don't let your dogs and cats run loose. Right. Um, wild hogs, we do have wild hogs here in Florida. And up there is the gentleman we can thank for that. <laughs> Mr. Ponce de Leon himself, old Wani, brought um, these <laughs> Spanish hogs with him when he came over. Um, you know, for obvious purposes, they felt like they needed livestock to bring with them. They brought the cows too, which now be become our Florida cracker cows. But um, these hogs you know, when explorers come and leave and then you've left these domesticated animals that go wild. And of course that was what 500 years ago, something like that. So they're quite wild. I've seen them trapped in um, a cage and you look in their eyes and there's nothing, there's nothing domesticated in them. What that you, you can't connect with, with, with them, you know, they're, they're not like your barnyard pig at all. Um, in fact, when I first moved here, when I was a kid, so we're talking probably 1978 or so. I had a friend, we went walking through the woods. I had no idea Florida had wild hogs. We must have came across some, you know, a nest or something. All I know is suddenly a mama hog was chasing us out of the woods. I was about 11 years old, running, running, running out of the woods with, and I was thinking, have we moved to Africa? I'm being chased by a wild boar. And luckily she gave up once we got out on the road. <laughs> so yeah, we do have them. And um, they will tear your yard up if they happen, if you happen to be on their route. <laughs> um, they have pretty large routes, but um, if you want something rototilled, it would be kind of cool to be able to train them to do that for you, but they will tear things up. So if you have them, get a professional trapper to come out most places you're not allowed to discharge a firearm so what they do is they trap them and then they may um, sell them to uh, people who put them in hunting ranges or you know some people keep them fatten them up on good grain rather than just wild stuff and you know use them for their own needs but um, it's something that it's a lot easier to get a professional trapper out there because you may not be allowed to discharge a firearm where you are, and also then what do you do with the, with the dead pigs? So, plus you need to get way more than one of them. Fire is, you know, can be a big issue. Did we say you were gonna cover this still? You look confused. You cover no, the- No, I could. Yeah, um, I'll tell you the one about the plants in the next one. Sure, obviously fire, is a danger. We do have certain years or certain times of the year where we have, you know, drought situations here. Things that get very dry. Forest fires will break out. For anybody who lives well out into the country, it should be a concern for them. And realize that fire is natural here in Florida. It's a natural part of our environment. Hundreds of years ago before we were here, they would in most of Florida have very, very frequent forest fires. So um, generally um, Pine Sand Hill areas, which is what Spring Hill is. Brooksville is a little bit different, but we have most of Florida's Pine Sand Hills. You would normally have a fire come through about once every three years on average. And even um, other areas that were a little bit wetter, it would never be more than maybe 10 to 20 years between fires. So fires are a natural part in the environment. But if you have a house out in the country and you're surrounded by woods and there's a fire, now you have a concern. If you do live out in the country, you probably wanna get some information from uh, Florida Forestry Service. They have a lot of really good information and handouts, lists of all the different plants that you should not have close to your house, how 
far of a zone around your house should be cleared with no brush or trees so that you have kind of a barrier if you have for when you have a fire go through the woods around you. You want to use a little bit of common sense and not have like cans of gas or gas grills or anything out there that should a brush fire come up, it's going to come in contact and you're going to have exploding grills and gas cans. Nobody wants that. So if you contact Florida Forestry Service or contact our office, if you want, we have a lot of really good specific information and checklists on what you should do to make sure that you and your property are going to be safe. So fire, if you live way out in the country and you're surrounded by woods, assume that one day you will have a fire. Like I said, it's natural. Most, most times, although Okay, Bill, I think you're freezing up on us. <laughs> so we will move to- Growing really close to your house because should they catch on fire, it's going to get, you know, make the fire even worse. So like I said, contact our office or uh, Florida Forestry Service, and they have a lot of really good information specifically on how to keep yourself and your property safe in the event of a forest fire. And, and here is a list of um, a lot of the plants that are very flammable, if you're very concerned about it. And you may look at those and say they're all Florida friendly, and they are. <laughs> But and most of them, most of them are native also. Yes, and they're native. But remember what Bill said, you know, Florida is a fire maintained wilderness. So of course this makes sense. But so if it is a concern of yours, then don't have these plants within that 20 foot defensible zone. We just, you know, showed you in that last graphic around your house. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I can send you a PDF of this or contact Florida Forestry uh, Service. They have all sorts of information on that. Oh, lightning. Um, we're the lightning capital of the world. I'm trying to move a little quickly here, so because um, I know we're running out of time. So if you hear the thunder, you know, just go in. <laughs> That's basically, you know, if you hear the thunder, the lightning is somewhere around. Somebody, you know, taught you count and that's how many miles away it is. No, that's I think proven wrong. Just if you hear thunder, you are at a risk of being struck by lightning. So stop whatever you're doing and go in. Um, I don't see that Karen has joined us today. So do you want to talk a little bit real quick, Bill, about um, mosquitoes? Sure. We have mosquitoes here in Florida as I'm sure all of you have discovered one way or another. Um, we do have, I think it's 50 some odd or so species of mosquitoes here in Florida. Not all of them vector diseases, but we do have multiple species that do transmit and spread and vector diseases. A lot of the ones that are kind of the worst at spreading diseases tend to be out during the day, so anywhere from very, very, from dawn, basically till dusk, we do have daytime mosquitoes and we have nighttime mosquitoes. So the most important thing you need to do is just be aware of this if you're out there. And it's a good idea, even if you're out working in the yard or the garden during the day to use some kind of mosquito repellent. You definitely wanna do that very early in the morning and also in the evening, use some kind of mosquito repellent long sleeves helps also. Most important thing that you can do is not be a mosquito breeder and always keep checking your yard for any standing water. And you don't need a full five gallon bucket of water to breed mosquitoes. All you need is one tablespoon's worth of standing water for mosquitoes to be able to breed in. So look and dump out things like um, tires, buckets, the trays to sit underneath a potted plant if that holds water, you're going to have mosquitoes in it. Bird baths are really bad for breeding mosquitoes in. Make sure you flush them out and clean them frequently. Every couple of days to every week is good. Uh, tarps, uh, you might have a tarp over a boat or a canoe or kayak. It, even if it holds just a little puddle of water, that's all you need to have mosquitoes living and breeding and multiplying in your yard. 
So the best thing you do is make sure you're not adding to the problem and then being aware of it and being as safe as you can be when you're out there working. And there's nothing, yeah, the best thing for your pets is, you know, the um, medicines that you get from your vet to protect them from heartworms that they can get from being bit by mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah. I am, I think that's it. We're wrapping it up. I know uh, Dr. Lester has to leave soon. So does Mr. Fody there. So just remember when you're out there, watch for the heat, watch for the critters. <laughs> Be very careful when it comes to equipment. You know, don't freak out over every insect you see. They're not all out to kill you and get you, but respect them and be careful. Lots of times for mosquitoes, for other insects, for heat and everything, how you dress is very important as well. Okay, let me... And I think a lot of these, just keeping your eyes open and being aware of you know your your surroundings and you know your circumstances out in the yard goes a really long way towards being safe yes and i'm going to put my email address in the chat because it's being asked for um and i'll put dr lester's as well okay thank you i was just about to do that his is so much easier than mine as he always what yes, mine's shorter and easier to remember. Yes. Um, yeah, see, somebody else knows someone who was bit by a uh, co-worker, or bit by a co-worker. I mean, <laughs> their co-worker was... We can't help with that. <laughs> yes, exactly. This is what happens when I read and talk at the same time. Okay, well, I know that everyone um, has to get on their way. So thank you all very much for this Lunch and Learn. Thank you, Dr. Lester. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yes, and we'll get together again. We always do. Um, you won't see me next week. I won't have a class next week because I will be on vacation. Um, but I'll be back the following week, but we won't have a live class. We'll have a special pre-recorded class on Friday the 30th, Spooky Gardens. So make sure you um, get onto the Facebook page after 10 o'clock that Friday the 30th and you should be able to watch that. I'm gonna have a special guest narrator for that one and it's not Dr. Lester. <laughs> um, it'll be a surprise. So thank you all very much. And um, tomorrow Dr. Lester at 10 o'clock has a virtual plant clinic every mm -hmm. single Thursday at 10 o'clock. So um, go to the Hernando County Extension, or you can go to my Facebook page, and I'll have uh, the link for it for you to join them there. And okay. if you ever want to find out all the information you need to know about all the upcoming classes that I have, Lily has, everybody else at our Extension office has, if you go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, there's a freestanding uh, web page there that has a full listing of all the different classes coming up and whether it's on Zoom or Facebook or both or neither or all the information you're gonna to need to be able to tune in and watch it is right there. So go to hernandoextension.com. All right, thank you all very much. Okay, great, thank you, bye.